This is like the reprise, the encore, because <laughs> uh, you came out for the L.A. event, yeah. and you came out for New York. You were on a red eye last night, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wanted to be here and uh, get to hear some different speakers, different topics. I think it's been a really valuable day. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about like your background, I guess, first. Yeah. Um, I guess similar to Jess earlier, I don't really come from a marketing background, so um, I have a bit of a lack of knowledge in the space, uh, especially relative to probably most of you in the room. But I came from the management consulting world, um, did a lot of kind of strategy and analytics for big Fortune 500 companies and got really burned out um, and decided to move into something that was a little more tangible, a little more fun, um, but came to Squatch mostly with uh, the angle of trying to bring some strategic thought processes behind our retention. How could we better engage our existing customer base, which was pretty big at the time and growing rapidly to make sure that we could have a sustainable long-term business. So, um, yeah, I joined about two years ago and have kind of taken on since then a variety of hats in the marketing org, uh, but it's been a blast thus far. Myself, I am the customer marketing manager at Repeat, uh, but started at Repeat in customer success, so we worked together there. Yeah. Um, prior to Repeat, I have been in the e-commerce industry for a while. Um, I was a Postscript customer before joining Repeat. I was a Repeat customer before joining <laughs> Repeat. Uh, so I've been in your shoes uh, quite a bit. I've yeah. built out a lot of SMS flows myself. Uh, so yeah. Tell us, I guess we can start with kind of what is Dr. Squatch's history? Where did you kind of get started with uh, SMS and Dr. Squatch? Yeah, I'll try to be a little less long-winded this time. Go as long as you want. Your answer was great. <laughs> um, yeah, we started uh, with PostScript about two years ago, um, and our experience was uh, very similar to our acquisition at the time, which was like full rocket ship, just uh, onboarding people and sending as many messages as we could get out the door. Um, and over time... Uh, we just began to see that it was by far the highest performing channel that we had on a um, any kind of our marketing channel basis in terms of ROI. And so we, we felt like we were obviously getting value out of it, but we needed to bring a little bit more uh, strategic thought. Um, a lot of the kind of topics that were brought up at the very beginning of this conversation around subscriber LTV was very much the way we started to explore this. And then um, over time, we started to realize that across our entire ecosystem there were a lot of different um, entities that were putting in uh, requests to be kind of sending messages to our customers and we realized we were not having a unified customer experience in our SMS um, experience and so we we really needed to then begin thinking about you know what were the right channels to be using and that's kind of where our journey started with repeat uh, uh, I guess that was about a little over a year ago now yeah. yeah. I know you've done some, some very sophisticated analysis. You've worked with PostScript's team to do some analysis. You you have some great skills in-house at Dr. Squatch and yourself as well. Um, what are some of the kind of key insights that you've taken away from what you've learned with Dr. Squatch and how has that kind of changed how you view the channel over time? Yeah, I think, I mean... For us, what we've seen is anybody we can get on SMS is massively more valuable. Um, I know that's not a surprise to anybody that's in this room. That's why you're in this room. Um, but I think what we looked at was effectively any cross-segment or cross-section or segment that we could find to try to assess where were the gaps or the inefficiencies in the program and actually take resources away from it if it wasn't worth our while, right? Um, and what we found was, surprisingly, our best customers on SMS are our subscribers. We, our original hypothesis was our subscribers, uh, you know, if we sent them a lot of messages, they would be more likely to churn because we would be kind of keeping a, uh, you know, an inundating them with whether it was campaigns or content, um, you know, just giving them things that maybe sparked enough of a frustration to get them to churn. In fact, it was the opposite. They stayed more engaged. Um, you know, I think the storytelling components that Jess was talking about, the brand engagement was a critical feature there for us. We don't just send campaigns. We send a lot of product drops. We do a lot of product releases, but we do a lot of like silly content. Um, a big part of our brand is mostly jokes, um, and we try to create content around those jokes in many ways. So I think we found you know unique insights for us that different 
different customers who we thought would be worse performing outperformed. Um, but in aggregate, we've seen you know LTVs in the first 12 months be 40% higher um, on average. We've seen LTVs for subscribers be 60% higher. We've seen customers who don't engage in any other format other than repeat, which I'll let Mark introduce repeat, increase their uh, LTVs 10% over the baseline and 10% over their performance if they were an average SMS subscriber if they also get repeat messages. So we started to just really segment and cross segment and say, where are we seeing out performance and how can we double down on that in many ways? So you've kind of, you've definitely doubled down. You've gone deeper into SMS. Yeah. Um, where have you kind of settled right now is kind of what's the, what's the perfect balance for campaigns versus automations versus uh, and content versus product drops kind of, yeah. what does that look like for you? Yeah, it's a great question. I think for us, we, um, we're definitely going to go, you know, anytime we have a product drop, lean into it heavily on the SMS front. We usually send two or three messages over the course of the kind of launch week. Um, and we usually launch at least one product a month, if not two. But we do rely pretty heavily on automations. Um, give or take on the month, 50% of our revenue comes from automations um, and 50% from campaigns from SMS. Um, and those campaigns can be anything from, you know, blogs about, uh, you know, men's balls health um, to blogs about our, uh, you know, summer sweaty sessions to uh, drops about products. So we, we really don't have to lean in really aggressively on discounting, which has been a big advantage for us because we have that um, really, really cohesive uh, customer base that's excited about what we're sharing with them and engaged with our content. We didn't talk about this last time, but I'm curious, are you using the kind of branching automations and replies uh, built into PostScript? Yeah, yeah, actually we just did a test um, yesterday, actually this morning, um, where we, I mean, a big question for us has been, how do we get these really bottom of funnel people off of the bench, is what I like to call it. Like, you know, we have, depending who you are in this room, I'm sure at least 50% of your list has never made an attributable purchase or somewhere around there. Um, so that's been a big topic of interest for me. So we just, like this morning, set up a, uh, a test where we effectively sent that whole list for us a bunch of options. What would you want? What would make you become a customer? Um, and then we had a bunch of branching responses. This effectively was a campaign that then had responses to say, okay, if they ask for a free bar of soap, all right, here's a free bar of soap. If they ask for you know, an introduction on how to subscribe or a discount on a subscription, here's something there. Um, but we've used, yeah, we've tested this in a variety of ways, but our most recent effort has really been, how do we grow that existing customer base who's actually involved in SMS in addition to how do we re-engage or continue to engage our current customer base. And, and getting them from prospects to customers, yeah. that's a really clever way to do it. Yeah. I guess once they are customers, what does, uh, what does the retention strategy on SMS kind of look like for you? Yeah, I think um, a couple of things. We have you know, your, wel your welcome flow, which I think is very similar to the exercise that they kind of walked through this morning. Uh, just to make sure, or I guess this afternoon, sorry, my time zones are a little mixed up. Um, but just to make sure that the customer really gets to know the brand, I think it's important, as they alluded, not to have, you know, offer, offer, offer right out of the gate, like make sure that the brand comes across. Um, a lot of our customers are coming from our paid media. And so they're seeing um, silly advertisements in some way, and it has to resonate and tie to that, right? You have to have a cohesive funnel across the board. Um, once they've made it through that first two weeks or three weeks of the funnel, um, I think it's really about using it both in a uh, way to keep the brand fresh, so that's our content side, a way to engage the customer at the relevant moments in their journey, that's our repeat side, and then, of course, to keep them abreast of any of our kind of key key moments like our product launches or our campaigns of, if we're having site-wide discounts. But um, it's really for us like the triumvirate of those things, I think, balances and supports that uh, retention objective holistically. Yeah. Um, when it comes to retention, yeah. uh, what do you think the balance on content versus offers breaks down to? Yeah, we send, uh, we try to, we try to not like, like I said, go super heavy into offers. Um, I would say, you know, if we have a really lapsed customer, um, 
our current approach that we're testing out is like similar to our get the person who's never purchased before, be very conversational with them and try to figure out why did they lapse. Um, that often does turn into some sort of an offer, but try to make it personalized and relevant to them. Um, we're not at the level that Okendo just talked about of zero party data where we could really come with very interesting features that are specific to that customer, I would say. But we try to use the insights that they give us in their message back as a kind of tool to that end. Out, like if they're not a really lapsed customer and they're generally an engaged customer, our typical mix is probably 50-50 between content and uh, offer types, depending on kind of how far into their life cycle they're getting and how far it's been since their last purchase. If I know you all, I'm guessing you're probably not super far off from using more zero party data in your... Ab absolutely an objective of ours. Uh, I would say like the, you know, the, the challenge for us is we have a pretty large customer base at this point. Like how do you build that zero party data um, when we didn't have things like the Okendo opt-ins where you can gather that data two, three years ago over the course of our really, really strong acquisition. So how do we go back and build that for that audience? A lot of what we've been trying to do is, you know, this direct outreach, this conversational tools to build out that CRM a little bit better and enable it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shift gears a little yeah. bit. Let's talk about automation and retention. Mm -hmm. um, let's think back like a year or so ago. You were one of the first brands to use our PostScript integration. Yeah. Um, but maybe a year back before that existed, what did automation and SMS when it comes to retention look like for you? <laughs> uh, candidly, very little. Um, I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm going to also caveat that I'm not the SMS expert on my team. We have somebody who has many people who are much more capable here and much more detailed, but uh, our automations two years ago or even a year and a half ago at the, you know, hey, is this a time for you to come back and really just think about your moment of replenishment? We're non-existent for all intents and purposes. If somebody made it past 45 days and hadn't made a purchase, like we know in general, our units per transaction is, you know, five. Our typical bar of soap lasts for a typical customer somewhere around two weeks. So, okay, somewhere between 45 and 90 days, they had to be wanting to come back if they were going to come back at all. So after 45 days, it was like, all right, let's start sending them things to see if they want to come back. But there wasn't a cohesive or thoughtful strategy around how can we automate this? How can we adjust the timing to whatever the customer bought? There was none of that in any way. So we're going to get into like precisely how repeat works yeah. in a minute, <laughs> but um, how has it changed from your perspective? Fast forward maybe a year and uh, talk to me a little bit about how repeat has affected that side of things. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two things that have really shifted that are enabled by repeat. One is accurate understanding of timing, looking at order history. Um, you know, the we have in the at this point several million orders that repeat can analyze and say, okay, a similar basket of this style tends to come back in this normative band, right? And we're going to hit them over a two-week span in that normative band. That's really effective for us, right? The other thing is they're hitting them with a perfect solution for the customer that truly wants replenishment, right? Like that says, hey, I know I really liked these four of your six bar soaps that I bought. I want those four bar soaps. If I sold them in a bundle, it comes to a cart. They click the link that comes in their SMS. It comes to a cart and the bundle's there for them to buy, or they could quickly disaggregate it and take the four bar soaps that they want with a one-click checkout. Like, the conversion rate on that spikes massively for us, right? We see something like a 12 to 15% conversion rate on that cart relative to our website where even, I mean, we have really good conversion rate for our returning customers, but, you know, we typically would see, like, at least a 25% relative increase on our repeat cart versus an average campaign to come back, a retention campaign of some sort. Your returning customers are interesting. <laughs> they um, are. <laughs> I know from working with you that they are prone to shopping around a lot. Yes. Um, you know, at repeat, we don't necessarily think of 
replenishment or reordering is just buying the exact same thing again right. and again and again. And your customers don't do that. Yeah. Um, what I, I guess, what do you know about your returning customers and, and what are their, what else do their shopping habits kind of show you? Yeah. What, one of like, one of the things that we as a brand have focused on, um, is scent proliferation. Um, it's a, you know, I mean, any, any CPG company will add SKUs to try to grow the top line, right? For us, um, we have about 15 core SKUs at any given time. Um, we call SKUs when they start to underperform or when we feel like, you know, we've, we've got a better product that we want to be on the permanent shelf. But we also have limited products that we drop um, typically on a monthly basis. And what we found is, like, there's no way a customer is going to come in and buy 15 bars of soap on their first order, right? Um, but they find that out of those six or five that they buy on that first order, at least three of them really spark their interest. And then they say, wait a minute, there are so many others here that I want to go explore. Let me go try them out. And then we have a matching deodorant in one of the scents that they tried on their first bar soap. And so they come back and they try that. It allows them to really get into this ecosystem where scent is the primary driver of their decision making uh, in everything that they tell us. And so they say consistently, you know, we want to explore our soap products that we have in other categories, whether it's hair care, they keep asking for things like body lotion, it's coming soon, they keep asking for, you know, every category that they can think of, they want it in our sense. And that's really been their um, consistent feedback to us is that we need to use uh, scent as a way to engage them. And that's one of that's been one of our like challenges that you kind of alluded with Reefy is, you know, we when we send them to the cart, they convert really fast and they convert really well. But when they come to our website, they don't convert as well, but they add a lot to our cart, right? Um, they add meaningfully more as repeat visitors. And so we uh, we really have to strike that balance for ourselves of like, when does it make sense to go to the repeat cart versus when does it make sense to go to the, the homepage in some respects, right? Yeah and, yeah. and figuring out kind of how to get them exploring between products. Yes. I'm guessing the ones that have bought multiple different types of products stick around longer. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you buy multiple categories, you're a much better customer for us. If you buy uh, multiple scents, you're a much uh, better customer for us over time. We find that just, I mean, things that you would think of if you were to come with your like basic, you know, eighth grade hypothesis, um, all bear out in the data, uh, which is really exciting for us because it makes our segmentation a lot easier to kind of get those core customers that we think are going to be high value to get them to come back if they're not doing so. Yeah. What did I forget to ask you? Was there anything we <laughs> talked about last time that, uh, that I missed um, or that you, that you feel like people should know? I think like one of the, the key opportunities in, in the SMS space that I keep like resonating around is, you know, how do you use it as a, um, it, it depends on your audience, right? Like our audience is very similar to the Feastables audience, like young people, typically young men who are highly engaged and highly mobile. They always are on their phone. Like our, I'm sure your guys' site metrics are similar, but we are, our site metrics are typically 90% mobile. So like for us, the SMS platform it started out as a like wonderful to have. It has evolved into a tool that is our fundamental like focal point for our retention marketing in so many ways. And um, you know, I mean, I think across the room today, there's been a lot of talk about wanting or at times SMS being the most powerful and profitable marketing channel that teams have. That's by far the case for us. I mean, for us, last Black Friday, for example, we did double our revenue on SMS as we did on email. Our email list is like five times the size of our SMS list, but we just happen to have a tool that we can use to engage. And for us, we have to get creative about how we do that. I think that's where the next evolution is for us is how do we take our really good creative content that's on our YouTube or our social channels, bring that to life in our SMS journey for the customers? How do we get better at things like Feastables is talking about where we build meme generators and shoot them out to our audience. Like if you go to our social, our Instagram owned Instagram is basically a meme 
factory, right? Like how can we bring those to life in our SMS um, to really keep that journey and that experience alive from the end to end version of the funnel, I think is really where we need to get to and where I'm trying to get us to go. But yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what does, what does Black Friday look like for you this year? You mentioned uh, <laughs> when I was talking to you earlier that you're deep in getting ready for that. Yeah. Yeah. I think for, for us, there's, um, there's been an interesting trend. We look back at the data from, from last year and, uh, the, this question that I've, like I was alluding, getting people off the bench, um, it's Black Friday is obviously a critical time to do that. So if you can grow your list now, um, you know, and you can get your list of customers to stay for 30 days, they're, you know, 90% likely to stay for the rest of their life or whatever it is. Um, well, by Black Friday, like those are your prime customers, right? But what we found was actually the thing that got them off the bench was like five messages in a row. Like <laughs> on our, on, when they received, you know, the Cyber Tuesday message was like the largest conversion moment for all of our customers. And so what we've started to do actually now is say, okay, we know that historically for us, if a customer buys in October, they have the highest propensity of buying in November and December. So how can we send five messages in a row, create a relevant reason to send five messages in a row to customers who are on the bench today, get them off so that they make a purchase today and a purchase in Black Friday, because we want to amplify that effect now, right? Um, and we want to grow, like we know that our core existing customer base is going to drive performance on Black Friday. So we want to get that customer base as big as possible today, in addition to leveraging what Black Friday will bring for getting customers, new customers in the door. Do you think you'll treat those returning customers differently than your prospects for that promo period? Um, for specifically Black Friday and Cyber Monday, uh, I don't think so, just given the value of the offers are so strong on our website. For the period around it, like we're really focused on how do we drive strong value through November and December, and that's absolutely where it'll be meaningfully different. Um, if you guys have ever been in the casino industry, you know, the term whales, whales are people that spend a lot of money. Like I'm really focused on SMS and whales as well. So December is like whales month in my mind where we say, Hey, you guys have already spent, you know, massively paid back customers. What can we do for you in this period? So can we do exclusive limited drops? Can we do, you know, exclusive discount days? We have collaborations or licensing deals with, um, Disney for right now for Star Wars. Can we give you exclusive access to a unique value proposition on Star Wars to keep those customers feeling rewarded because we know things that are going to happen that are going to frustrate them in Black Friday are slower fulfillment, are you know missed paced packages or orders, and ultimately we're going to need to create a better experience for those high value customers to continue to stay with us in 2023 too. So, cool. Yeah, I really admire what you all are doing with sms uh i want to keep talking to you about it yeah. but uh repeat sent me here so <laughs> absolutely do it <laughs> all right so uh quick overview of how repeat works because that's the reason i'm here aside from really liking cody um so essentially repeat works in four parts we take in all of your Shopify orders historically, we're going to take those orders and analyze data like the reorder intervals per product. So how long people go between orders of a specific product, um, a customer's product and purchase history, and a specific customer's order timing. We're going to take that data and push that into triggers uh, that go into PostScript, that go into Klaviyo, other channels. Uh, and allow you to kick off those automations we were talking about at just the right time. So based on when that customer is most likely to order, we're going to send the trigger into, uh, into PostScript so you can hit them with a message uh, and make it happen. Uh, we have the cart, which is not shown here, but where this link goes right here <laughs> on this message from Dr. Squatch, that's going to go right to Repeat's cart, which is filled with the products that they've purchased in the past. We're gonna show which products they're due to reorder to make it super easy to add those to the cart. Uh, and then for those customers that kind of wanna explore a little bit, we've got a merchandising section that's gonna show other products that they might like. Uh, 
And I fixed the typo from last time. Customers buy again in just 20 seconds uh, <laughs> is how quickly they can get through that cart. And that's going to point them right to the Shopify checkout. Um, if they have shop pay, they can check out in a tap. Um, but we, we want to make that cart experience as easy as possible. So uh, repeat to break it down uses data automation and personalized experiences to boost revenues from the channels that you're already using. The part of that that we didn't talk about here is uh, channels. So we start with the automations uh, that's going to feed into the channels like PostScript, like Klaviyo that goes into the personalized cart and then feeds back into the insights that make that all stronger and kind of complete the cycle and make it better next time. Uh, so there's a quick look at the personalized cart. We've got the do to reorder section. We've got the you might also like section and a quick click to checkout. Uh, so we see increased conversion rate. We see increased average order value from brands that are using this like Dr. Squatch. Uh, and then our insights section, which is uh, got a great boost recently. And there's some cool data in there that we've looked at for Dr. Squatch, but uh, we show you all of the insights that power repeat automations we bring that into a dashboard so you can see uh, all those insights. You can see what's feeding into that automation. You can see things like the time between orders for specific products. You can see uh, time between orders as customers progress through their life cycle. Um, so like what's the expected replenishment interval for a customer on their second order versus their fifth order. Um, lots of great data in there. Uh, data that honestly doesn't exist in other tools that I've used um, and things that you can use to improve your merchandising, your, uh, your strategy in other places, your acquisition offers lots of cool things in there. So that's repeat. Um, and we've got a minute or two left. If anyone has any uh, questions about uh, repeat, about uh, Dr. Squatch's strategy, anything you want to hit us with. Yeah. Can you use uh, the repeat landing page for non-customers? We, we, uh, for anyone who didn't hear, can you use the repeat landing page for non-customers? Um, in theory, you could. Uh, we don't recommend it. We're pretty hyper-focused on uh, returning customers. Um, the reason we don't recommend it is we've stripped back a lot of the information that might be on the PDP. Um, a lot of those kind of selling points and things that convince first time buyers, um, but a returning customer doesn't necessarily need and things that kind of get in the way of it. Don't sleep on their socials. They got some really good content coming out of this place. I'm, <laughs> I'm a big believer that content is king. Like it's, you know, that's going to be the, uh, I don't know, future for CPG companies. And these guys, these guys got the great content coming. So. On that, yeah. on that topic, you said like you'll text people about like ball health. Yeah, so yeah. How do you like commercialize that content? I mean, so our, our blog lives on our, our website and uh, like every one of these products that were, every one of these blog posts that we're sending somebody to or a YouTube video that we're sending somebody to has an integrated link to back to our site, back to if we're like talking about Ball's Health, one of the things that we talked about in there was like your ability to actually use deodorant down there if you want to, right? Um, and so like it has a link, hyperlink in the blog post to our deodorant. But what mostly happens is exactly what Mark was talking about. Customer comes and maybe reads the blog post. I'm not really sure. Maybe they're just engaged with the like funny tagline that we send in the SMS. And then they go straight to our homepage and start searching. Um, so it's mostly an exercise of a customer getting back to our website and keeping them engaged with something that resonates based on the way our brand language and our brand um, content has kind of continuously existed for them throughout their journey. So on those sends, are you yeah. really tracking just like re-engagement and traffic? Not yeah. really like no revenue. I mean, we, yeah, we look at like, we get a, we, we have really strong ROI on, on the revenue side. Definitely not like if, if, if we had a site-wide sale, we're going to get a better revenue per send, but we're, we're particularly sending those kind of messages to highly engaged customers, right? And those customers will typically come back, our whales, they will come back, they will read, maybe they will read, like I said, but they will typically buy when they make it to our website. Um, and I think it's a 
show of appreciation for what we're bringing to them in their everyday. We hit our time. Yeah. Uh, you're hanging out with us for the happy hour. Yeah, I'll right? be here. Cool. Um, Leo is going to be here. Kim is here from repeat. Um, so come say what's up to us. I also have some cool repeat hats and stickers. Uh, they're really good. I'm not going to lie. Um, so yeah, thanks Cody. Appreciate you. And, uh, thank you guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Post-trip.